many historians think that the Crittenden plan could have received a majority of support in the Congress. It could have. Um, had Lincoln thrown his support to it, it probably could have passed Congress. But Lincoln opposed it. Lincoln killed the Crittenden plan. What would have happened if the Crittenden plan had been adopted? Well, probably the border states would stay in, the Deep South would stay out, but maybe over time they'd come back. Who knows? There might have been more negotiation. Maybe it would have led to the failure of secession. Why did Lincoln reject it? Well, there's many reasons. One, not necessarily in this order, it would have meant the disbanding of the Republican Party because radical Republicans would never accept a plan. In fact, the entire Republican platform was based on the non-extension of slavery. So now you're abandoning the platform on which you ran and won the last election. Um, but more seriously, go back to the House Divided speech. Remember when I quoted that, I said, remember that sentence, a crisis must be reached and passed. This is the crisis. If you compromise, you're just going to have another crisis. The fundamental problem is still going to be there. No compromise will solve it. It would only postpone it. So, moreover, Lincoln was very taken with the idea that the Crittenden plan was an invitation to southward expansion. He wrote, he said, if we give in on this, the South will soon be demanding the acquisition of Cuba and Mexico as the price of staying in the In other words, you don't give in to threats, you know, to the threat of, once you give in, every time they want something, they'll threaten secession. Next year it'll be Cuba. Next year it'll be Central America. Next year it'll have to do with fugitive slaves. Um, a year will not pass, he says, until we will have to take Cuba as a condition upon which they will stay in the Union. Lincoln's opposition, more than any other single individual, a lot of people opposed, killed the possibility of this compromise. The only compromise measure, so to speak, that was actually passed by Congress was a proposed 13th Amendment stating explicitly that Congress had no power to interfere with slavery in the states. In fact, in his inaugural address, Lincoln said, I, that's all right, I don't mind if we ratify that, because I don't think Congress has the power anyway to interfere with slavery in the states, and if, if we want to put that in the Constitution, fine. This is the proposed 13th Amendment. Of course, the Civil War renders it moot immediately. The irony, of course, is that when a 13th Amendment is finally added to the Constitution, it is the one irrevocably abolishing slavery, not guaranteeing slavery from interference by Congress. Um, no compromise would have satisfied the Lower South. To get them back in, I think the only thing that would have satisfied the Lower South was, you know, the, the, the Civil War was a terrible, terrible thing, but the consequences of compromise might not have been that great either in the long run. It would have meant the destruction of the federal government, the power of the federal government basically to do anything about anything, and the destruction of freedom of speech in the United States. It would have meant that you could not criticized, and by the way, there were, Douglas himself in the secession crisis proposed a federal sedition law making it a federal crime to criticize slavery. That might have helped get South Carolina back in, but that's a, that would be a strange path for the United States to go on as a democracy to criminalize criticism of slavery. Um, then there's the kind of question which we, you know, is almost impossible to answer really why not just let them go? Why not just let them go, as Horace Greeley said? Good question. You know, you can, you can adduce answers. The notion of American mission, unionism, nationalism. Obviously, it was very strong. Very few people in the North said, let them go. Northerners, Democrat, Republican, anywhere willing to fight to save this nation that seven states wanted to leave. Why? I, that requires us to do what no historian has ever really successfully done, to trace the history of American nationalism from the, re from the Revolution up to the Civil War in culture, in politics, in religion, in education, in all sorts of realms. 
until the point arises where they, there just was no support for acknowledging the, the secession of the South. Well, so Congress deliberates and, as usual, accomplishes nothing. That's what they generally accomplish nowadays. And um, Lincoln is still waiting. You know, the inauguration of the president back then takes place March 4th. So there's a several months hiatus there. But when Lincoln takes office, as I said, a majority of the slave states are still in the Union. Moreover, the Buchanan administration has now stabilized as a pro-Union Northern government for the last month or two of his presidency. And in that period, um, as soon as, in, we don't have a map here of Charleston Harbor, maybe you've, anyone has ever visited Charleston, you can look out from the battery and see the forts and the harbor. There was a little federal, you know, unit stationed at what they called Fort Moultrie. But um, Major Anderson, a Kentuckian, the commander there, thought that their position in Fort Moultrie was quite vulnerable. And on December 26th, right after secession, he, without telling or asking anyone, he moves his little unit to Fort Sumter, which is further in the harbor and very hard to get at in order to protect them from some kind of assault from South Carolina. The governor of South Carolina is outraged. He sells to Buchanan. You've got to tell them to go back to Fort Moultrie. Buchanan says no. They can stay in Fort Sumter if they want. And indeed, in January, in January, Buchanan, or the administration, sends a ship, the Star of the West, to bring food, supplies, not guns, but supplies, to this unit of troops at Fort Sumter. Southern cannons at the battery fire on the ship and it runs away. It, doesn't, it can't get in supply. But that happened in January, so it was pretty clear what would happen if you tried to resupply Fort Sumter. It already had happened under Buchanan, but it was sort of drowned out at that time by everything else going on. Well, Lincoln travels to Washington by rail, giving speeches along the way, February into early March. Most people had never seen Lincoln. They'd seen images of him, but Lincoln, this is the first time Lincoln physically is seen by hundreds of thousands of people as his train goes along and he speaks. And he talks about peace. He talks about the need for union. People give him polite applause when he says, but we may have to put our foot down. There's wild applause. The, the, the people who go out to see him are bellicose. They're angry. They're getting frustrated. Um, when he gets to Baltimore or nearby, there's talk of an assassination attempt, and Lincoln has to get secretly, he has to take a train secretly, another train secretly uh, in disguise almost into Washington. He enters Washington in a most ignominious manner to avoid a, proposed, a possible um, assassination attempt. Um, March 4th, he gives his inaugural address a very interesting, profound document. He denies the right of secession. As I said, the nation was created by the Revolution, by the Declaration. It can't be broken up. By, it was created by the people. He says, I will uphold federal authority, but not enforce it. It's not that different from Buchanan. Not necessarily enforce it. I will hold forts in federal control. See, as the southern states seceded, they took federal property, forts particularly, on their land. And they also seized, very cleverly, the mint at New Orleans, which was full of money. And that financed the Confederacy for the first year. It's robbery, but they took it. And um, so whatever federal property is around. But you had these, a couple of forts, Fort Pickens off of Florida, Fort Sumter, which were offshore, and Confederate forces couldn't really quite get to them. Um, Lincoln, in his first draft, had said, I will re hold and retake federal property. But Seward told him, no, take out retake. That's a threat. And Seward edited Lincoln. Even though Seward is thought to be such a radical, Seward edited Lincoln's first draft. We have in the Lincoln papers Seward's handwritten, you know, handwritten editing to make it more peaceable and less threatening. The only threat, so to speak, in the, in, in the first inaugural was this sentence. 
in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. So Lincoln puts the possibility of civil war on the agenda in his first inaugural address. It did contain real concessions, particularly the suspension of federal authority. He would not retake the property, the forts that had been taken. Sort of like Buchanan's policy, actually. 